All right, so um, today's discussion is going to be on reactions at the alpha carbon. So um, we've been doing a lot of carbonyl chemistry and where we have a nucleophile attack the carbonyl carbon. But now what we want to do is talk about some other reactions with carbonyls and specifically at the alpha carbon. Okay, so we had um, where a nucleophile can attack to make like an alcohol, for example, or a nucleophilic uh, acyl substitution. Um, but again, now what we want to do is something that has an alpha hydrogen can actually be removed to form something called an enolate. We've seen these before. Um, and this enolate can, it is electron rich, and so therefore it can react with an electron deficient species or an electrophile. And there you go, you pretty much have something um, to work with, a new nucleophile. So notice the top two uh, are different in that one of them has no leaving group um, and the other one does have a leaving group. Now the alpha carbon chemistry doesn't really have an, a, a leaving group, but it does have an acidic proton. Okay, so remember, let's go back to ketoenol uh, tautomerization. If we have a ketone in the in an acidic or basic medium, we can have this transformation as as shown. It's an equilibrium, so you can, for example, protonate that oxygen of the carbonyl, and that gives you an oxonium intermediate. Now that positive charge on the oxygen, again, makes that carbon very electrophilic, but it also affects the surrounding environment. So it actually makes the alpha hydrogen very uh, acidic. And so basic water can come along and remove that. And then you get your enol and that goes back and forth, right? Uh, obviously there's gonna be a, it's not gonna be 50-50 mixture of the keto, uh, ketone and the enol but um, there is varying percentages depending on what's, what kind of environment we're working with. In the, base, uh, in the presence of base, we have this structure where we have just the hydroxide, for example, come remove that acidic proton, and then we end up with our enolate. So here's an example um, that's actually, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a biological um, example. Just to show you, it's, I mean, this, I think I mentioned in one of the previous videos how much um, biochemistry is going to rely on carbonyl chemistry. And so um, there's another example, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate uh, as well. It, it can undergo that ketoenol tautomerization to form dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And this transformation is important because dihydroxyacetone phosphate is a an important intermediate and a variety of metabolic pathways for both plants and animals. I think the plant one is um, like a process of uh, in the absence of light. So you can check that out on your own. But let's say uh, move forward like before. So we have a carbonyl group, right? So we want to protonate that carbonyl oxygen to form an oxonium that in, makes that adjacent proton acidic. We can remove that and that uh, creates the enol with the carbon new carbon-carbon double bond formed. And then um, now we have what you can see is almost like a, a double enol. We have an, uh, an OH on one side, uh, the top and the bottom. So if you think about the equilibrium mechanism, you can quickly move on to dihydroxyacetone phosphate just use the uh just go backwards on that equilibrium and um do the other side though right so um the lone pair from the oh on the top can create that carbon oxygen double bond to form uh and and the kick those pi electrons out and that results in the protonation of that carbon and we have a new uh oxonium intermediate and then just Upon deprotonation of that uh, hydrogen on the oxygen, we get a neutral species, which is the desired product in the end, shown at the top. And so, um, again, this is a very common mechanism, and 
there are a variety of pathways that it's gonna you're gonna see that in biochem for sure. So keep an eye on the mechanism uh, and also make sure that you're familiar with um, or you have the ability to just jump straight to it. That's gonna take some practice though. Okay, so um, I mentioned before that you can have different percentages of the keto enol or the um, d depending on the environment. And so what I meant, I mean, yes, it could be the medium that it's in, but it's also the surrounding uh, chemical environment. So like an aldehyde versus a ketone. So there's different carbon connections and hydrogens as well. And so there's going to be a different, uh, it's going to affect the, the magnetic as well as the chemical environment of these protons that are being shuffled around to form the ketone or the aldehyde as well as the enol. And so, so here are, what I'm, I'm creating is a, a, a generic list of a variety of carbonyl compounds with um, different enol forms. And so uh, what we're going to, what we want to focus on when we're looking at this list is the different structures. So uh, you can imagine um, the aldehyde, the acid aldehyde on the, on the top. Just you can apply that uh, that structure, the, the the equilibrium to a generic aldehyde, or the ketone below acetone, or the diester, or um, any of these structures, and we can apply these generically to a variety of R groups. But um, what I'm giving you as well is the percentages of the enols that are formed. And so we can use this information to, um, to our advantage in the types of chemistry that we want to do with these. So obviously these, the, the topic of today is reactions at the alpha carbon, right? It's not just the formation of an enol or an enolate. It's what are we going to do with that after? And so the percentages of these, so the percentages of these that I have uh, are the percentages given on the right are the percentages of the enol forming. So as you can see, the aldehyde, we've got nothing pretty much. Uh, same thing for the ketone. But you can see as we change the functional group surrounding that carbonyl, uh, we have a change in the percentage of the enol. Um, and eventually we've got actually the formation of majority of the enol whereas before all the other ones are um, mainly the the carbonyl group and so this is the information that's going to be extremely useful to us because we can see that this di ketone on the bottom or the the combination of the esters and carbon the different two carbonyl groups in there we can see that those are forming a higher percentage of enols and this is going to be helpful for us to functionalize this carbon containing compound even further and so um what you can what you see here is that the beta dicarbonyl compound may actually uh the dominant species might actually be the enol so here we have 76% and um this is because of the ability to undergo intramolecular hydrogen bonding and if you look at the PKAs on the right, 17, 20, 13, 11, and 9, you can see that they're decreasing as the percentage of the enol forms. And that's no coincidence. Um, in order for that enol to form, we have to be able to remove that proton, right? And so um, if it's more acidic, it's going to be easier to form uh, the enol. And it's going to uh, be just inherently a more reactive compound. So what can we do with these enols though? Well, once we have these enols, as I mentioned before, we have an electron rich species, but the nucleophilic site it would actually be, if we just ignore on this enol structure, if we ignore the OH, this just looks like a normal uh, alkene, right? And <clears throat> as we know from last semester, alkenes are nucleophiles and so they can react with electrophiles and that's exactly what these guys do. If you can imagine the lone pair on the oxygen coming down, creating that carbon oxygen double bond, we kick off that electron or that pair of electrons and those that nucleophilic carbon is now attacking the uh, E plus or the electrophile. 
And so when it attacks there, we have an oxonium intermediate, obviously, and then with the loss of that proton, we have a new carbonyl compound, or a new ketone in this case, with a hydrogen substituted with a new electrophile. And so this electrophile can be a variety of things. Um, what we'll see is that it's, it's going to be an SN2 reaction. Essentially, we have a nucleophile attacking a... Uh, it could be a halogen or it could be an alkyl halide and uh, it's just going to be a variety of things and we've seen these before. What's important is that we understand that um, these enols and as I'm about to show you enolates are nucleophilic and um, other than that this chemistry is not going to be new to us. It, so as if we were learning another concept here we let's talk about enolates right so we have um, an enolate, remember, is going to be formed in the presence of base. Base comes along, rips off the alpha hydrogen to form the enolate. <coughs> and now this negatively charged oxygen can throw those lone pairs down, create a carbon-oxygen double bond, and then now we essentially would have um, that nucleophilic carbon attack and electrophile. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, this is a diketone which as you saw above, that those alpha protons are super acidic, right? Um, nine, pKa of nine. And so we form this enolate. And the reason why this particular ketone or diketone is actually more acidic than all the rest is because it's got that um, the enolate formed on the right side, but we also have a resonance structure where the enolate is formed on the left side. And so that gives it the pKa of 9 because the stability of the uh, conjugate base is better because we have two resonance structures, or technically it's three if we drew the structure, the resonance structure that contained the negative charge on the alpha carbon, but I omitted that one. Uh, just because we're focusing on the enolates right now. As you can see, the bottom has two resonance structures that are in the enolate form, and then the top only has one resonance structure in the enolate form. And remember, uh, resonance instills stability in a conjugate base, and therefore more resonance structures that are reasonable is going to result in a more acidic uh, proton in the acid, or the conjugate acid, if you want, wanted to work with the base. So... Um, a variety of compounds are going to react either exactly the same and or as this in terms of removal of an alpha proton. Um, so carbonyls like amides and esters, very analogous, right? Makes sense. Um, but one that's not very, not exactly analogous or not exactly straightforward in understanding the similarities is the cyano group, right? It's still considered an alpha carbon because we have the removal of that proton that can create a resonance structure within that carbon hydrogen uh, multiple bond. Uh, the pKa of the ester, however, is 25, while the pKa of the amide is 30, and the pKa of the alpha proton on the nitrile group is 25. The ester and the amide uh, pKa's are a lot higher than other um, carbonyl groups because remember these esters and amides also have re competing resonance structures on the nitrogen or oxygen side. So the lone pair on the, the, the nitrogen and the amide can create a resonance structure just on its own. So that's competing and that's what's ultimately affecting the acidity of the other proton. All right, so let's check out some examples on this topic. So which is the most acidic proton? So we've got a carbonyl or a ketone, we've got a nitrile, we got an ester, and we got a another ketone. Okay, so there's going to be there could be multiple acidic protons on uh one given carbonyl group. So for example, I just drew out one set of protons initially on that top ketone, and then we've also got a couple more drawn in blue. And so that's what we're going to have to keep an eye out for is the opportunity to remove more than one type of proton. And so we'll get into this in a little bit. Um, 
when we talk about unsymmetrical carbonyl groups. But first, let's try and rank the uh, acidity of the circled protons. Sorry, and it, it kind of looks like an oxygen at first, so I'll just draw it in like scribbly blue. So there's two hydrogens on each of these, right? And so which of these is the most acidic, which is the least acidic? So um, we have to remember that the beta diketone is going to be more acidic because we have an enolate formed on the right side as well as the left side. <clears throat> And so um, the next compound, we can see that upon removal of that acidic proton, we have an enolate on the left side. But the carbonyls are not close enough to form two resonant structures in, or two different types of enolates. So we move on to the last one, which doesn't have an enolate forming at all. And so the most acidic is going to be the far left compound, the second most acidic is the middle, and then the least acidic is the far right. And this is all just due to the amount of resonance structures because <clears throat> that carbon or that hydrogen is in question is bound to the same type of element. Um, and so essentially what we're working with is resonance. So <clears throat> we talked about certain percentages of enols and enolates. And so we have to, let's think about it, right? So if we have all these really small um, percentages of enols, um, we also don't have a negative charge on those, right? So enolates are actually going to be better for the types of reactions that we're gonna go over where we're substituting an electrophile on the alpha carbon. And this is because, uh, well, they have a negative charge, right? Um, and so they're going to be more nucleophilic and that being said, we want to form a higher percentage of those enolates, right? So this is technically an acid-base uh, reaction, so it is an equilibrium. But if we have a really strong base, then we're driving that equilibrium to the far right, if not just pushing it to the point of no return. So for example, <clears throat> if we have sodium hydroxide or sodium alkoxide, that's what the NaOR is, or potassium terbutoxide, sodium hydride, or lithium uh, diisopropyl amide. This is abbreviated as uh, in the formula form like this, or we can call it LDA. And LDA has the following structure. It's called lithium diisopropyl amide. It's, it doesn't have the, it's not a carbonyl compound. So don't get confused by the name. It's actually a nitrogen that's negatively charged. And um, this, we've, we've seen these before, right? Sodium amide was just NH2 minus. So don't get confused by the name. Uh, this base is extremely important because those isopropyl groups cause steric hindrance. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's go back to the percentage of the enolates formed. So sodium hydroxide, we got less than 1%. Potassium tributoxide, 1% to 10%. As it gets more basic, you'll see that sodium hydride and lithium diisopropyl amide uh, have 100% of the enolate being formed. And um, this is going to be really important, also very useful, right? Because this is going to help us regulate how quickly our reaction can move forward. But know also that if you have something harsh like a sodium hydride or LDA, uh, those can uh, cause other problems. And, and if your molecule is large and uh, has a quite a, a variety of functional groups within the same molecule, then you can get a lot of mixtures of products. And so this is something to can, keep into consideration for um, on paper as well as in the laboratory. So how do enolates react? So as we'll see, um, or we can anticipate that they'll react similarly to enols, right? But the one difference is that we have, uh, it's, it's just gonna be more of if we're upon observation, we'll, we'll notice that, well, wait a second, we got a negative charge on the oxygen in the enolate form, so why doesn't that oxygen react with the electrophile like um, 
like we might anticipate. It actually, and it does form the alpha substituted carbonyl now, as opposed to the um, electrophile being placed onto the oxygen as shown here. <clears throat> so this is more something that we just need to know, but also think about uh, if we had a resonant, the negative charge on that carbon, carbon is more nucleophilic than oxygen because it's less electronegative, so that carbon ion is just pissed off and it just wants to attack something, right? So that's what it's going to do. Um, there's also a molecular orbital theory that we can discuss, but that's, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of beyond the scope of the class. Um, so let's just move on to unsymmetrical carbonyls, and um, let's just keep in mind that the enolate is itself something called an ambident um, nucleophile, meaning it has two nucleophilic sites. And so <clears throat> um, let's take a look at this unsymmetrical carbonyl, though. Sorry. <clears throat> so let's say we had this cyclic ketone, for example. One side, we don't have anything on the alpha carbon, and the other side, we have a methyl group that creates uh, three total protons that can be removed, uh, two of which are the same on the left. So I'll just draw that in blue. Uh, let's say we used LDA and we had it really cold, like minus 78 degrees Celsius. In THF, you'll see this on reaction arrows. It is just a polar aprotic sol solvent. It's a cyclic ether. And so um, let's take a look at the other option. So if we drew that other proton in red that we can remove, um, we could form a new carbanion. And the way we would form this one is using a different base, obviously. Um, so LDA would selectively choose that carbon, uh, that proton, that blue proton, while potassium terpetoxide and tert-butanol would selectively choose the red proton. And this is because it is the thermodynamic enolate. It's the thermodynamic product. Whereas the blue carbanion would be the kinetic enolate or the kinetic product. And that's because this is the less sterically hindered proton. And so that bulky LDA base can um, more easily grab the blue proton and um, as opposed to that red one that's going to be kind of blocked off by that methyl group. So the way we can f uh, favor kinetic enolates is with a strong bulky non-nucleophilic base with a polar aprotic solvent like THF and then having it really cold. So remember we talked about kinetic and thermodynamic products before for, during our discussion uh, for the addition of HBr to a diene. And so remember that resulted in a 1,2 addition as well as a 1,4. And so the same concepts can be applied to the formation of a kinetic and thermodynamic enolate. <clears throat> so, and so the way we're going to favor the thermodynamic enolate is, um, well, first of all, the reason why it forms is because the, if we think about the enolate structure, we have a carbon-carbon double bond in it. And in this case, it's the most stable alkene that would be formed because it's more substituted. And that's why this is the thermodynamic product. It's the more stable product, right? And so we're gonna favor the formation of this compound by using a strong base, such as an alkoxide, like potassium terpetoxide. Um, we also wanna use protic solvents. And the reason why we wanna use protic solvents is because we're gonna allow this acid-base reaction to go into equilibrium, and equilibrium favors uh, the more stable product. That's also why we are going to have it at higher temperatures, um, because this will allow the uh, equilibrium to, um, to kind of take place, and then again, the equilibrium favors the most stable product. Now, so that being said, yes, we can initially f form the uh, enolate on the other side where we remove that blue proton, but since it is in a protic solvent, it can easily get protonated. And then also at the higher temperatures, it's gonna shift back and forth. And so we're gonna drive it to the most stable product in the end. Okay, and that's why we have these two different scenarios to form the kinetic and the thermodynamic product when we have unsymmetrical 
carbonyl groups. <clears throat> okay, so what are we going to do with these now, right? Well, what we want to do is halogenation at the alpha carbon. We've been talking about substituting these darn alpha carbons with electrophiles, right? Now let's just do it. So let's say we have a generic uh, methyl ketone, right? So we only have, we have a ketone where it's just a CH3 on the end. If we add some ha elemental halogen with a base or acid, we can form this substituted, uh, this alpha substituted carbonyl. And let's give you an, a practical example. So in a, an acidic medium, we have protonation of that carbonyl group, right? What is this supposed to do? Well, it's to form the enol, right? Which is our nucleophile. And we form the carb, uh, sorry, the uh, oxonium first, allows the removal of the alpha hydrogen to form the enol, which again is our nucleophile. So what's our electrophile on this, right? We got a lot of stuff in there, but chlorine is the, the electrophile in question. So remember when it comes to uh, chlorine elemental halogens, they don't have a straight up dipole because of the same element or the same atom, right? And so, but what they do have is an instantaneous dipole. And that instantaneous positive charge on a chlorine allows it, the nucleophilic enol, to, to attack it to form the uh, alpha substituted carbonyl after obviously the removal of the proton. So, there you have it. That is the way that we would functionalize the alpha carbon with an elemental halogen. Let's try another one. So using an enolate, we have obviously basic medium. So on the left side, we don't have a proton to remove. So we don't have to worry about thermodynamic or kinetic products. We just remove the acidic proton at the alpha position this forms an enolate, but again, we can just draw it in short form as the uh, carbanion because that's really what's doing the work. Just for uh, simplicity, for explanation, we have the attack of that bromine because of the instantaneous dipole that formed. But let's say we had additional bromine present and as well as additional base. Well, the presence of that bromine on the alpha carbon creates a more acidic proton on the alpha, alpha carbon. And so upon removal of that proton, we get another enolate forming. Um, but as I've drawn just the carbon ion, we can now, we have this new nucleophile that attacks elemental bromine to form the uh, di-substituted alpha carbon now. And so this is something that we can do um, in the presence of excess base as well as excess uh, elemental halogens. So it's not just for bromine, but uh, that's what the example is. So what if we had a methyl ketone? So a ketone with uh, just a CH3 on the end. Um, well, we have th now we have three protons that can be removed. And so in the, in the presence of excess uh, base and elemental ha halogens, we've we were working with something called the haloform reaction. And this is called a haloform reaction because we form a haloform. And so those of you that are in lab or creepers of the night might know that HCCl3, for example, is called chloroform. And so that's where haloform comes from. We also form a carboxylate as a, as a byproduct or as a product. And uh, this is actually a useful tool in the laboratory to determine if we have a methyl ketone specifically because uh, we can form uh, precipitates that are unique to methyl ketones. So <clears throat> the way this works is let's say we had uh, boom, remove a bit, remove a proton, substitute with the halogen, and then we do that three times. We end up with a uh, three halogens on the alpha carbon. Now, this carbonyl carbon is super susceptible to nucleophilic attack, right? It's got really electronegative atoms adjacent to it. And so that hydroxide that's present can attack the carbonyl carbon. Well, now this carbon with these three electronegative atoms on there is actually a good leaving group. And so that's exactly what it does. That car the oxygen kicks down the electrons to form the carbonyl group. Uh, in turn forming the carboxylic acid as well as the CX3 minus that left. And this is a good leaving group because that carbon's 
negative charge on it is stabilized by the electronegative atoms adjacent to it. And so um, <coughs> this, uh, this actually ends up forming the carboxylate by removal of that acidic proton on the carboxylic acid. So what can we do with these? So there's a variety of things we can do with these after the fact. And um, this is again why our toolbox is just exploding because now we, we have, let's say we just have one bromine on that alpha position. Well, in the presence of lithium carbonate, lithium bromide, and D DMF, that's dog, Mary, uh, French fries, <laughs> we, ha we end up forming an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. But if we have an amine, we can um, undergo, it, that bromine can be substituted with the amine via an SN2 reaction. Or... Um, and then this gives us a new carbon-nitrogen bond, which is amazing, right? Because this is another way to make carbon-nitrogen bonds that we didn't know. And it's very straightforward as well. It's chemistry that we knew already, right? Uh, nitrogen as a nucleophile attacking a essentially an uh, alkyl bromide. And so it's, uh, again, it's really useful. So don't you got to focus on it, but don't get overwhelmed by the fact that it's semi-new because we know this stuff. Enolate alkylation. Uh, so let's say we removed that acidic proton with the base. We have that carbanion. Well, that carbanion from the enolate can attack an Rx. So that's an alkyl halide. And again, this is just an SN2 reaction. So we know that alkyl halides undergo SN2 reactions. And so we just need a nucleophile, right? So this whole chapter is just introducing enols and enolates as new nucleophiles to do to attack electrophiles that we are already familiar with. So LDA removes the proton, forms an enolate that attacks this uh, allylic halide, and now we've got this new fancy carbon carbon double bond chain coming off. And so one thing I want to point out here is that we end up with a racemic mixture. And that's because if we're going to form a resonance structure for that enolate, we have a carbon-carbon double bond, right? And so that carbon-carbon double bond is sp2 hybridized. And so we can view this carbanion as sp2 hybridized. And if it's sp2 hybridized, that's planar. And that means that we can attack from the top or the bottom and thus giving us a racemic final product. So this is really important to remember. Um, but again, pretty similar to a lot of the stuff we've already gone over, right? <clears throat> Let's take a look at this cyclic ether, uh, or I'm sorry, cyclic ester, um, in the presence of LDA and very cold. What does that mean, right? Well, that just means that it's going to be the kinetic product. But in this case, we don't really have a competing reaction. So sometimes the colder temperatures are just kind of toning down the reactivity of a given uh, chemical reaction. So we can attack a new alkyl halide and then we get a, uh, an ethyl group coming off of that ester. Let's see another example um, that's not a carbonyl, right? Remember I said nitriles are analogous because they have an alpha carbon uh, with an acidic proton. And this can be done with LDA at 70, minus 78 degrees Celsius with another alkyl halide, and then boom, we get that methyl group on the alpha position. And so um, this it's it's pretty straightforward as long as we realize that um, that alpha carbon is the nucleophilic site as opposed to, um, at least in the enolate form, the oxygen. So how might this form? Well, what we see is that the five-membered ring is still present in the product. Uh, we also have the carbonyl group still there, but now it's bound, that methyl ketone is now connected to a ring, right? So how might we do this? Well, um, first of all, <coughs> we want to point out that we do have two acidic protons, right? We've got the one in red, which would be very 
easy to access, right? Uh, and if it's easy to access, then that's usually going to be the kinetic product. And so when we're choosing which base we want to use, we want to use the LDA at the colder temperatures, and that's going to form this uh, methyl enolate right here, which can then undergo an intramolecular SN2 to attack that uh, carbon with the bromine on it and kick that out, forming that three, four, five, six, seven membered ring. Now, I like to, as I mentioned before, number the the carbons in the product as well as in my the my structure preceding that product, just to ensure that I have got all the correct carbon-carbon bond, uh, bonds and the, my bond connectivity is on point. So let's say we removed that blue proton though, right? Remember the blue proton was harder to access due to sterics, and so that is going to be the um, thermodynamic product because that enolate is the more substituted uh, enolate. And <clears throat> this is going to be done typically with maybe potassium terbutoxide in a polar product solvent such as terbutanol. And uh, that uh, attacks intramolecularly still, but what we end up forming is a different ring structure with a carbonyl compound in it. So we've got two five-membered rings fused together as opposed to a seven-membered ring and a five-membered ring. So remember from ring stability last semester, six-membered rings are the most stable and five and seven, they're, they're kind of, they might be similar. So in terms of the most stable product in that sense, they could be very similar. However, the thermodynamic product in this case would be the blue structure because that thermodynamic enolate that we formed. And again, I like to number my carbons just to make sure I have the correct bond connectivity. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the red is the kinetic product with LDA, minus 78 degrees Celsius and THF. Um, and then the blue is the thermodynamic product with potassium terbutoxide and terbutanol and uh, so one thing I want to mention, THF, uh, oh, minus 70 degrees Celsius, I told you guys this is achieved by combining acetone with dry ice, and then also the potassium terbutoxide in terbutanol is not a mistake, right? So you wouldn't want to use potassium terbutoxide in methanol because you have the possibility of forming methoxide instead. So you usually put the alkoxide with its conjugate acid as the solvent. So another example that I love is <laughs> because now look at that structure. That's, that's crazy, right? Like um, if I asked you to make this a couple, even a couple weeks ago, you probably would look at me like, um, no, no, thanks. Bye Felicia. Um, or you might just spend hours on the internet, but now we actually have those skills to do that. Starting from this dial right here. Um, think anybody know what this is? I'm talking to myself. It's actually catechol. No, I love this as a starting material because, um, it's really, it's, I don't know, it makes really cool compounds. So naturally it occurs in some fruits and vegetables, but, uh, catechol can be derivatized to form uricial which is the substance that mm, we all know and love to be found in poison oak, right? Or poison ivy, whatever. Uh, makes you hella itchy. So that's cool, uh, maybe. But also, catechol, you might recognize it um, from the term catecholamines. Uh, maybe you haven't heard of that, maybe you have, but I know you've definitely heard of neurotransmitters as, such as dopamine, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and so those are all catecholamines and they have again similar structures to like meth um, but also they have this catechol uh, functional group in there as well and so that's why I like this as a as a starting material um, makes some pretty cool things um, I guess arguably the substance drawn above could be considered a catecholamine um, because it does have very similar structure to um, meth and uh, or like those neurotransmitters, those catecholamines. 
uh, take a look at them if you want. Now the structure I gave you is actually uh, MDPV, methylene uh, dioxypyrovalerone, and this is a cathinone derivative. It's actually like a dopamine uh, reuptake inhibitor, and uh, <laughs> it's bath salts. Remember I told you guys we were going to learn how to make these? People eating other people's faces off when they're taking these things. Um, bath salts were actually sold in liquor stores as like Epsom salt. They were like literally, yeah, this is bath salt. But like, like I mentioned before, who goes to a liquor store or a gas station to buy bath salts? Like it was drugs. It's kind of silly. But um, so uh, people were taking these drugs, eating people's faces off, and boom, we're about to learn how to make it on paper. Don't do this at home. So we know that uh, a diol in the presence of a ketone and an acid forms this acetal, right? Okay, so now we have a benzene ring, electrophilic aromatic substitution with this acid chloride and aluminum chloride gives us this product here okay now we have a methyl ketone what's up what did we just learn today throw a strong base in there like sodium hydride we form the enolate enolate attacks an alkyl halide we just extended that carbon chain by three carbons we fancy now right okay so you can also probably just use a longer acid chloride but it depends on the whatever i mean we want to we want to do synthetic chemistry right if i limited your the scope of the reagents then maybe you can only use through the three carbon chain right so if we did that okay now we've got acetic acid with bromine right this is our acid acidic medium and we form the enol which attacks the elemental bromine to form that alpha substituted carbonyl and now this bromine can be attacked, or this carbon can be attacked by this amine, this nitrogen nucleophile. That gives us our final product. And um, again, works on paper, right? Um, definitely don't do that. Don't even think about it. Just, just have fun on paper. Melonic ester synthesis. Let's talk about how we can utilize this um, uh, to form two different types of carboxylic acids, right? We've got the malonic ester to form uh, di-substituted at the alpha position or mono-substituted at the alpha position. So remember <clears throat> the ester um, hydrolysis in the presence of acidic water can form a carboxylic acid as well as an alcohol, right? Well, the diethylmalonate um, can do the same thing. We form this beta diacid, right? Now, this beta diacid is fancy in that if we do a little bond rotation around that carbon carbon bond, we form this, right? I've drawn this suggestively to create what looks like a six-membered ring, and now we can shuffle electrons as well as atoms around. And these red arrows are allowing us to create um, a new enol and as well as carbon dioxide. So this carbon dioxide pieces out, we form this enol, and now this enol can undergo tautomerization to form the carboxylic acid product. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's Basically, we need to know that in order to see how we're going to use these malonic esters in order to form uh, car new carbon-carbon bonds. So, how, for example, if we had this particular species here, we have a, uh, we have two carboxylic acids adjacent to one another. We also have two carboxylic acids adjacent to one another on this one. And then we have a carboxylic acid next to another carbonyl. Oh, and carboxylic acid next to another carbonyl for that one. So notice above here, I said this is a beta diacid, right? So this this is the alpha position, that's the beta position. So we have to have two carbonyls adjacent to one another in this sense. They have to be that close. We have to be beta to one another. This will allow us to do 
the decarboxylation, which is the loss of that CO2. And uh, otherwise, we can't do it. So let's redraw this structure here. Remember suggesting the six-membered ring here because, again, six-membered rings are super stable. And this, this transition state will allow for the shuffling of electrons forming the enol as well as the carbox or the the carbon dioxide sorry <laughs> that leaves so now we formed a new carboxylic acid in the end this one won't move forward because this carbonyl is gamma to the other carbonyl and this one is beta as well so this one will actually work we can short form just jump straight to the new ketone um, and this is even further away. So that one's not going to work in that um, particular decarboxylation step. So another way it can be drawn is CH2CO2ET in parentheses, subscript 2. So we have to have a base. So remember, these malonic esters are super acidic because they have the two carbonyls that can um, form the two different enolates on both sides. And... <clears throat> our sodium ethoxide is our choice of base in this case. And then we have um, our enolate formed or the carbanion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once we form that carbanion, that is now our nucleophile, right? The nucleophile can attack our um, alkyl bromide shown above. And upon attack of this alkyl bromide, we have a new carbon-carbon bond being formed. And this is the structure we have here. So upon the addition of H3O+, plus as well as heat, we get hydrolysis of those esters to form the beta diacid. And then the heat it drives the reaction forward to uh, for, force the decarboxylation and we end up with the carboxylic acid with the new uh, cyclohexane addition on the end of it. So again, I like to check my bond connectivity. So by numbering the, um, or in this case, not numbering, but just noting the carbon-carbon bonds, so I highlighted those all in red just to see where they were, and also what came off, that CO2 came off. And so let's take a look at another example. What if we had two additions of sodium methoxide as well as two additions of uh, methyl bromide? So now what's going to happen is we are actually going to remove a proton, substitute with a methyl group, and then um, substitute with a methyl group again upon the addition of that base because we still have another proto proton there and that acidic proton can be re removed as well and then the reaction can proceed um, as usual. And so this is the structure drawn in blue. That's where we would get the carboxylic acid with two R groups on the alpha position. We just have to do the substitution twice. Add base, add the alkyl halide, add base, add the alkyl halide. And um, we can actually get two different groups if we wanted as well. So this one is super fun. I like this one. Uh, the malonic ester uh, synthesis with a an alkyl halide, but it's uh, an alkyl halide, it's two of them within the same molecule, right? So, so the question what happens, would right? be, um, what happens if you do a malonic ester synthesis with this, with this alkyl halide? So we want to start with malonic ester. Drawn here, um, we would have the addition of a base to remove a proton, and then we have to show the substitution uh, SN2 reaction first, and then the addition of another uh, equivalent of base to remove the pro the extra proton at, at that alpha position, and then another SN2 reaction to form the cyclic structure. So ultimately, what we have to know, or what we should be able to do, is just jump straight to the final product. So this circled portion right here 
is actually going to be carbo turned into a carboxylic acid and then ultimately a carbon dioxide. So that leaves. All you have to do is just remove that. You can erase that almost. And then the portion on the right, we just have to make sure that we convert that ester to a carboxylic acid. And now we have this cool carboxylic acid with a four-membered ring on the alpha position. So I'm going to highlight this in red and uh, the alkyl halide uh, portion in red and then the carbonyl group in blue just for clarity for you guys to see what ultimately happened and how we were able to jump from the diester to the carboxylic acid product, which is something we should be able to do um, just for the sake of time on an exam, for example. All right, so another type of question <coughs> could be, um, what alkyl halides or uh, what, well, it, it would just say what alkyl halides were used in order to create this carboxylic acid via a malonic ester, malonic ester synthesis. So what we want to do is work our way backwards. So we know that the alpha carbon is where the substitution occurred. And since we have two alkyl groups on the alpha carbon, we highlight those in blue and red. And then we convert those into alkyl halides. And then the green portion that's left behind is the carboxylic acid. That's what the melonic ester, uh, that's, that's from the melonic ester. So draw it out, add an X on the end, and then the other portion is the melonic ester. And there you go. That's the easy way to work your way backward. You can also draw it out and then try the reaction forward to see if that's what you get in the end. Um, I would suggest you make sure you count all of your carbons, making sure you don't count the alpha carbon. So you don't want to add too many carbons um, to your alkyl halide in order to get that final product. All right, so <clears throat> we have another one that we haven't really seen before, um, or we've been talking about malonic esters, right? And so this is a dicarbonyl group but it's not a melonic ester, as you can see. It's a cyclic ketone with an ester kind of popping off on it, right? So let's say we had LDA and alkyl halide and H3O plus, boom, what do we get, right? This is actually what we get. We get um, the addition of that alkyl group from the alkyl halide to the alpha position and um, we lost that carbo that ester portion, right? And so how does this work? Well, it's the same as the melonic ester synthesis, but since we had a ketone in there, it's more, more uh, similar to an acetoacetic ester synthesis. So acetoacetic ester is a ketone next to a carbon or a, an ester rather than a, an ester next to an ester, okay? So this would be a beta keto ester, and this alpha, these alpha hydrogens are still very acidic because they are nestled in between those two carbonyls, and so we can still get two car, uh, two uh, enolates, and therefore that resonance stabilization makes those protons very acidic. So. What we end up getting as our final product, however, is a methyl ketone. So the ketone, notice we have, it, notice it's a ketone rather than uh, a carboxylic acid like the uh, malonic ester synthesis. And um, we get two R groups on the alpha carbon. Okay. Another thing, uh, just want to name that uh, beta keto ester for you it's an ethyl acetoacetate. Uh, hence, uh, aceto -es <laughs> acetic ester synthesis. So, um, here we go. Let's try an example for you. We have this aceto -ac uh, this ethyl acetoacetate here, and we have these acidic protons that we're going to draw out for you. Now, we want to remove those uh, with a base, and so in this case, I'll choose sodium ethoxide. And let's choose an alkyl halide. 
Here we go. And then in the end, we want to throw in H3O plus. This H3O plus in heat is going to do the, the rearrangement, the decarboxylation to give us our final product. So sodium methoxide, boom, grab that proton to form the uh, enolate or as we will draw it just here with the carb carbanion. That carbanion is our nucleophile, attacks the alkyl halide to give us this alpha substituted carb dicarbonyl. And uh, I'm gonna abbreviate that cyclohexane ring with a CY just for clarity. Now we can add in the H3O plus in heat that F removes essentially the um, the red portion here and then we're left with the blue portion in the end and that is our final product as well as co2 <clears throat> so um, again numbering just to make sure we've got all our uh, carbons in a row ducks in a row and um, just to double check it doesn't take long but it, it can be the difference between a wrong and a right answer so the next portion uh, or the next example would be, uh, let's say you want to use ethyl acetoacetate in order to form a given product. Okay, so what are we starting with in order to make this interesting looking ketone, right? So remember, acetoacetic ester, or uh, yeah, <coughs> if we're using ethyl acetoacetate, we know that the red dots came from that, and we know that we have to add the blue dots and the super cool lime green dots uh, uh, in the form of an alkyl halide. And so I would just dot those out, add an X to it, and there you go. And that's, that's how I would do my retrosynthetic analysis on a given carbonyl group to form it from uh, either the malonic ester or the uh, acetoacetic ester synthesis. Now, this guy right here, can we do that with this synthesis? No, we can't because if we look back to the alkyl halide that we have to form, it's a, it's a, it's a bromo or it could be, it's a halobenzene, right? Halobenzene, that halogen is attached to an sp2 hybridized carbon and we cannot do sn2 reactions with sn2 or with sp2 uh, carbons, right? And so that's dead. That means we cannot form it like that. We'd have to find another way to do it. All right, so just to summarize the reactions we went over today, we did, uh, again, substitution at the alpha carbon. Uh, if it's a methyl ketone, we can add a, a, a halogen with elemental halogens as well as acidic medium. If we had it in basic medium, excess base and halogen and results in a halo form reaction to form a carboxylate as well as a halo form. Um, if we had a longer chain on that ketone, we can either we can multiply substitute that alpha position. Um, and if we have that alpha position substituted with a halogen, we can um, do an SN2 reaction to add a new nucleophile there. And we saw that a number of different ways. Um, if we have that, um, we can also add the lithium bromide and the lithium carbonate and DMF to form the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Um, the methyl ketone with base and an alkyl halide to form the new carbon carbon bond at the alpha position. We also went over melonic ester synthesis as well as acetoacetic ester synthesis to form new carboxylic acids as well as new ketones respectively. And so um, these reactions, the mechanism is kind of weird at first. I think it's super fun because I love kind of doing the little swoop de swoop little do -si do with electrons to form that CO2 and the new carboxylic acid or ketone. Um, we should be able to jump straight to that final reaction though. And so I think uh, that's all she wrote, y'all. Um, chapter 21, homework, 32, 35, 37, 41, 43, 45, 46, 47, 49, 53, 56, 57, 59, 61, 63, 
that's it. Um, uh, obviously, you can do more of these if you want, but it is, I mean, it's the practice is, I'm going to leave that up to you guys. Um, I don't really have a good joke for today. Um, kind of bummed. Like, I didn't get you, I gave you, I came in with the Kool-Aid Man and Britney Spears last time. Um, I got nothing. I got bath salts this time. So, I mean, there you go. And also, I could leave you with a little photo and video. Whoa. <clears throat> Cruising. Emmy, do what your brother did. Come this way. Let's see how fast you go. Do it. Nice. Whoa. Ah. <laughs> nice work. Just need to practice on our steering. <laughs>